think so. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Welcome to this press conference with Roberto Azevedo of Brazil. Mr. Azevedo will give a brief opening statement and then we'll take your questions. We have 30 minutes. Once again, I'd like to ask you to please keep yourself to but one question in the interest of time and equity. Mr. Azevedo, you have the floor, sir. I don't really have a statement for you, but I would probably, I think it would be useful for you to have a, uh, a feeling of what is it that I said in the room, if you don't have it already. Uh, but the idea is that I made a presentation to members um, during my 15 minutes allocated to myself. I explained uh, from my perspective, because I told them until now, everybody knew me, everybody had seen me participating in the WTO meetings, but as Brazil's ambassador. Now I am a candidate, so I tried to make sure that it was probably the first time in the last uh, 17 years uh, that I had been working here in the organization that I was in the building expressing my views, my personal views about things and not the views of the Brazilian government. So that was very important to clear up from the very beginning. Um, I pointed out uh, that um, in my view, the organization in its three pillars um, has a problem, a clear problem in at least one of the pillars. One, the first pillar is of course the uh, implementation of the agreements, of the existing agreements, and that's working well in the subsidiary bodies. Um, the second pillar is the dispute settlement uh, pillar, and I think that is also working well. Uh, there is a way to improve it, particularly making it uh, workable for the smaller delegations, the delegations which uh, really have uh, uh, difficulties trying to use the system. Uh, it's a costly, heavy, lengthy procedure. Um, and, but the third pillar, which was the pillar of negotiations, that concerned me most. Uh, at, at the end of the day, it has been now almost 20 years since anything has been negotiated in the WTO. And people are concerned in general about the fact that the WTO is, is outside the radar. Uh, they don't know uh, how, what to do or how to put the WTO back on the, on the agenda. And uh, my explanation to them was that unless the WTO began to deliver again in terms of results, in terms of new agreements, new disciplines, it would remain outside the radar of public opinion, of public operators in general. No amount of speeches, no amount of roadshows, no amount of marketing is going to change this reality or make the negotiations advance. So in my view, if you want to change the situation, you need a DG who can do a hands-on job. He has to sit down with members, roll up the sleeves together with the members, and face the issues head on. For one, I don't think that we can move forward without resuming the round. Unless we sit down and try to figure out a way of making the round move forward, the system will remain clogged. Of course, the WTO has many things to do. It is much bigger than the round, but the reality is that the round is clogging the system. So unless we do that, unless we find a way to move forward, this system will remain paralyzed. Now, my point to them was that I had the ability to do it, I had the expertise to do it because I could operate both at the technical and the more strategic political level. Why? Because I have been doing this for a long time and then I have the trust mostly of members from all different trends and positions. Um, I could dialogue and uh, openly and exchange views with trust with, uh, in a constructive spirit with members from all different ends of the negotiating spectrum. And so that in itself was very helpful. Besides being able to talk to all of them, I knew the issues. I know the issues. So I can help in identifying solutions, creative solutions, that would help uh, the organization move forward. And finally, over these years, I have developed a network that goes all the way from the operators on the ground, you know, analysts, economists, all the way up to the highest levels of the political decision-making ladder. So 
in that sense, I thought that I was um, a good fit if the organization wants to move forward also on the negotiating pillar. In, in essence, that's what I suggested, that's what I said, that uh, I felt how I felt I could contribute to the system and, um, and uh, answered uh, questions for a long time. And I guess I'll have some more now. So <laughs> I'm open to you. Uh, I'll try to respond to your questions as, as, as openly and, and in a straightforward manner as I can. Uh, the first question to Tom Miles, followed by Assis Marrera. Tom, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Uh, Tom Miles from Reuters News Agency. Um, this is a really interesting race, uh, and I think um, every candidate has uh, some perceived weakness. And if you have a perceived weakness, perhaps it's that you're one of the two uh, never to have um, held ministerial rank. Um, and whether or not you think that's important, at least a lot of people are saying that um, to get deals done, you don't just need to have the, um, uh, the bureaucrats and the officials working together, you need stuff at the highest political level. So how many heads of government have you got on speed dial who you can just ring up and get things moving straight away? Because if you're stuck at ambassadorial level, then deals may never be done. Have you, have you really got that reach into the top echelons of government? Thanks. Thank you. Well, um, that was an unexpected question. Uh, let me tell you this. I, um, just last week, I was in Davos. Um, I spent there uh, essentially 24 hours. In those 24 hours, I talked to eight different ministers. Um, of delegations which are key in the negotiations. And those were not uh, uh, around the table. It was bilateral conversations with them, uh, quiet conversations with them. Um, and that didn't happen because uh, they got to know me now. That happens because they know me for quite a while. I have been the chief negotiator for a long time for Brazil. As chief negotiator, I can't possibly move negotiations or determine what to do or how to engage with the others unless I talk to the highest level of the decision-making process and the ministers are at the top. So I feel absolutely comfortable in terms of getting reach of ministers. Um, and to be frank with you, I, I don't have their numbers on my phone, but I guess my secretary to call them. <laughs> and um, they have a very good, they're very good at that. So I don't have a problem with that. Um, the second thing is, I, I think that um, what we need today, more than anything, is expertise to find solutions. And that doesn't happen, frankly, at the ministerial level. Ministers are very important to close rounds. Yes, sometimes they are. But you have to walk 90% of the way before the ministers can really finalize the deal. We are not 90% of the way done. There's still a long way to go. So if you want to work only at the political level, you're going to be stuck. I don't know what DG could possibly close a deal talking to ministers only and without understanding what the problems are at the negotiating table. So what you need today I think more than anyone that can talk to ministers, and, uh, and I think that uh, pretty much everyone there can talk to ministers and does talk to, do talk to ministers all the time. It's expertise to roll up the sleeves and work at the negotiating level. If they can't do that, if the DGs can't do that, I think they're in trouble, uh, frankly. Um, one last thing to conclude this, 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 this answer. Um, for a long time, the, the, the multilateral trading system was led by director generals who came from the system, right? Uh, until the WTO, actually, none of the director generals had been ministers. All of the rounds were concluded by those guys. Since 1995, since the ministers took over, and I'm not saying that ministers can't do the job, huh? <laughs> by the way. Uh, since then, no round was ever concluded. So as far as statistics go, I think I have a pretty good chance of closing a deal, uh, maybe more than, than, than ministers or ex-ministers. So anyway, that's, that's something that I, I wanted to say. One more thing. The UN was headed by a non-minister who actually got a Nobel Prize. 
The World Bank today is headed by a non-minister. What's so special about the WTO? So that's for what it's worth. The next question for Assis and then Fernando. Assis, you have the floor. Assis Moreira, Valeu Econômico São Paulo. Ambassador Azevedo, bom, you respond more or less to the first question. The, the, my question is, the first criterion to be select director in your view, apart expertise, what could be? And secondly, what could be, should be the most important task for the first most important task for the next uh, DG? Immediately. For the next DG? Yeah. Okay, I think uh, besides expertise, um, what you would need is a DG that will not face uh, mistrust in the membership, that the membership feels that you, they have a DG who can understand, who can listen, who can talk to all sides of the negotiating table. I think that's the greatest uh, asset that the, the next DG could have besides being very knowledgeable of the system. As far as the biggest challenge, as I said in the room, I think the biggest challenge for any DG at this point in time is solving the round in whatever way. The reality is that the round at this point in time is paralyzing the system and we have to solve it. It's not an option. It's not a question of time that you give more time for that to happen. Time will never be perfect. There will always be countries in different cycles. The economy, if it's growing too fast, then there is no incentive. If it's growing too slow, then countries get more reluctant to open their minds. There will never be a good time. So we have to face the gaps as they exist today, and we have to face them immediately. So I think that's the biggest challenge for the next DG. Fernando, you have the floor, followed by Ravi. Fernando, please. Fernando Pucho, la Agencia EFE. Uh, it's a simple yes or no question. Um, do you favor a Latin American agreement or consensus to try to facilitate that the next DG comes from Costa Rica, Mexico, or Brazil? Well, frankly, it doesn't matter what I think. What matters is what the Brazilian government thinks. It's, uh, the support to candidacies are granted by governments, not by, by the candidates themselves. Uh, I, I think Brazil made clear from the beginning, from the very beginning, that uh, it favors uh, that the next DG should come from a developing country. And it also believes that it should come from a developing country, preferably from Africa or Latin America. Ravi, you have the floor. Sorry. <coughs> Ambassador, uh, listening to you today, you know, uh, reminds me of what I heard yesterday from Tim Grosser in the same room. Both of you seem to have same experiences, a lot of uh, technical skills and expertise in negotiations, particularly in agriculture. And in fact, some of the ideas that you have now just now expressed about rolling up sleeves and sitting with members to work is what Tim Grosser also said yesterday. So somewhere, somewhere around the two parallel lines going at this point of time, how would you qualitatively differentiate yourself from Tim Grosser? Well, it's not me who should differentiate myself from Tim Grosser. It is the members who have to differentiate me from him and make a decision on the basis of that differentiation. Um, I think there are many different elements in my personality, in my uh, expertise, or my background from his. It doesn't take a long time. I'm from Brazil, he's from New Zealand. I'm not saying that that's dispositive, but that in itself, I'm from a developing country, he's from a developed country. Uh, I, am, uh, I have been in the system since 97, and I never left. So I have, I'm quite uh, familiar with the, with the status quo of negotiations, of positions where members are at this point in time. You know, I started it in Geneva since 1997 when I was posted here for the first time. I never left. That, the organization was two years old at that time. And when I was in Brasilia, I spent most of my time here in Geneva anyway, uh, to the despair of my family. But uh, I was here in Geneva negotiating the whole time. And now I'm back here again as an ambassador. So I think what I, one of the things that I would point out uh, myself is that I have been following the negotiations nonstop from the beginning until now. So there are no 
black holes in my uh, participation or in my knowledge of uh, the disciplines, uh, the, the, the history of the negotiations, the position of the, mem of the member countries throughout negotiations. I think that's something that, uh, that is quite important to have, you know, the, uh, an uninterrupted sequence of events and knowledge of the, of the issues as they evolved. Next question for Jamil Chada. Jamil, you have the floor. Ambassador, um, it's very good uh, that we can ask a question to know what you actually think and not what the Brazilian government thinks. I think it's the first time we can actually do that. And I'm going to take advantage of that and ask uh, if you think that the package in July of 2008 is that right? was a missed opportunity, and that was the package that had to be in to be um, uh, adopted, and what would you do different now from that? Well, I think there were many missed opportunities, not only that one, um, for different reasons. Um, if you ask me, is there anything that I would do differently then, or anybody could do differently then, I'm not sure that that would be possible. I think that people did what they could at that point in time. Um, and they went as far as they could to try to get a deal. I don't honestly believe that anybody in that room was saving uh, cards or was saving movements for at a later stage or was playing games. I think all of the countries who were engaged in negotiating at that point in time, like in other moments of the negotiation as well, they were doing the best they could to get an outcome. But they had political constraints at home. They had... Uh, constituencies that they had to respond to. And there were limitations on the position. Maybe there was no overlap on what those countries could do that could possibly allow the conclusion of the negotiations. Um, so I don't, it's, it's, it's a question of, if you go back in time, would I do things differently? Maybe, a little bit here, a little bit there. Would I be in a position to do something so differently that would allow the negotiations to be concluded, I, I don't know whether that would be possible. I don't think that anybody had a lot of room there anymore by the time that we got there. Next question for Dan Prusen, please. Dan? Yes, Ambassador Dan, Daniel Prusen with BNA. I'd just like to follow up on your answer to that question. You talked about um, the negotiators did everything they could um, in 2008 to try to agreement, but there are these political constraints and constituencies to answer to. One could argue that these political constraints are even greater than they were uh, back in 2008, and that these constituencies are probably even more militant against the idea of any sort of trade agreement. So what you, you said, it's uh, critical to get an agreement on Doha to advance, but realistically, what hope is there, given that these forces against the agreement are probably stronger than ever. Thank you. If we do this, if you do things the same way that we were doing before, the chances, my view, zero. So you have to do things differently. How differently? In what way? What do we have to change to give you an answer, which is the answer that I gave to, to, to the delegations in there? I don't know. But many times, when I helped to unlock stalemates, I didn't know either when we started the conversations. You know, it was listening to the delegations. You know, what is it that they're saying? What are the driving forces behind them? What did they do in similar situations in the past? Sometimes even the negotiator, I know that guy, he's holding something back. You know, even, even those things are helpful. And then, after a lot of conversations and interactions and dialogues, you begin to notice a little thread that is common to every position. At that point in time, if they trust you, and if they know that you're trying to achieve a balanced solution, you know, a creative solution, a viable and doable solution, they begin to listen to you. And then they begin to examine your proposals, maybe you offer a way out here, a way out there, and all of a sudden, a solution that didn't exist before then materializes. You know, and people begin to engage, and then you have a completely different dynamics, and you end up many times in a, with, a, with a mutually satisfactory solution to everyone. So I, I, I think that uh, if, you, if, you, if you look at the round, and if you say, are you going to all of a sudden now solve the round 
the way that things were before, the way that things were doing, bef that, the way that people were behaving and negotiating before, I don't think it's doable. I think we'd look at it with fresh eyes. That doesn't mean, by the way, before any of you infer that, that doesn't mean giving up the mandate. I don't think you actually can give up the mandate. The mandate is not, it's not politically feasible to give up the mandate. But there are ways of delivering the mandate, looking at things from a fresh perspective. How fresh, how different, what perspective, I don't know. That's what I have to sit down with members and try to figure out. Uh, Jamil wants to ask another question, and I'm happy to give him the floor. But first, is there anyone else who would like to ask a question first before I give it to him? Jamil, take it away. Ambassador, this is a very uh, high, high risk job. Uh, some people have arrived as DGs as a very big hope for the organization and left uh, with, the sit with their reputation, I would say, uh, not as, let's say, as equivalent as the WTO itself. Uh, um, you say very clearly that uh, if the round is not solved, uh, the WTO will continue to be marginalized. Uh, why do you want this job if it's so risky and if the chances of failure are very big still? Uh, no one questions your ability, but uh, politically, it, the risks are very, very high. Why do you want this job? My mother asked that question. <laughs> so you're not the first one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> he called my mother, probably. No, my mother asked that question, and I told her, Mom, if I had stopped every time that I had to make a risky decision, I wouldn't have gone anywhere. No, every decision, every job I take, there are risks. And a lot of the things that I have done in my life, if you had asked me at the beginning of the process, did you believe that you could actually do that? Did you believe that you could actually pull that off? Did you believe that you could actually get there? I would say no, not in a hundred years. But if I didn't try, I wouldn't have achieved those things. If you had asked me, honestly, at the beginning of my career, do you see yourself as the permanent representative of Brazil in Geneva? I would say, are you crazy? Out of your mind? No way. Here I am. If you, asked, would you, if you had asked me a couple of years ago, would you see yourself running for the DG position? I would say, you are absolutely out of your mind. And when this idea first was floated, frankly, I would still give that answer. Are you out of your mind? I don't want to do that. But over time, I convinced myself, and I was thinking and talking to people, I, don't, I think this is doable. Is this a sure thing? No, I don't think this is a sure thing. I, th I think it's going to be a Herculean test. But if we don't face it, it's not going to happen. So at some point in time, you have to take risks. And I'm taking this risk. But it, just to finalize, the risk is much bigger for the members than for me. They are the ones who take the risks. The families who live in those countries are the ones who are taking the risk of inaction, not me. So uh, my risk compared to the lives of millions of people across the, 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 the globe is minimal and perfectly uh, uh, disregardable in this context. We have time for one more question, and it's to Ravi. I just want to come back to you know the systemic crisis that we are facing in organization after organization. And in fact, in the very collapse of this whole uh, economic narrative that countries are pursuing over the last 30 years. This is also the case in the trade narrative, namely this mercantilist framework. Do you actually think that uh, there has to be some rethinking on this whole you know, crisis in terms of mo doing things differently from what is happening because of this whole pursuit of you know, economic liberalization, mercantilist, trade framework, climate change. Where are we heading, and would you have some ideas on this? Look, Ravi, I think that uh, if, you, if you try to solve all the world's problems in one take, it's not, it's not going to work, right? I think we have to take one step at a time. We're talking about the WTO. You're talking about 
what is it that I could eventually do if I am appointed DG of the WTO. In that context, I think that you have to follow, you know, the, or, the principles that guide this organization, if you look at the preamble of the Marrakesh Agreement, and I mentioned that in the room, are three, essentially. If you boil it down to three things, the first thing is members will negotiate agreements that will reduce tariffs and barriers to trade. That's the first principle. The second one is that in doing that, they will bear in mind that all this is for living, uh, raising the standards of living and achieving full employment. And the third thing is developing countries and the smallest of the developing countries have to secure a, a commensurate share of international trade according to their needs. And this is what we have to do in the WTO. You can't, and I said in there, Trade is extremely important, and I, for any economic model, in my view, are you going to cut my time as well? No, no. Okay. <laughs> I operate on a different standard. <laughs> so, the, uh, I think that trade is important. The degree that an economy is competitive in global markets is a benchmark, which is important to, 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 to measure the sustainability of any economic model, in my view. But trade is not the ultimate goal. It is a means. And it is a means to achieve development, social development, and to, include, uh, to increase the conditions uh, of living of, uh, of the real people in the world. And that balance <laughs> exists in different ways in different countries. No country is going to open up trade if that's going to, in his view, that government, going to sacrifice the conditions of living of his people, right? And they will if they think that the conditions are appropriate and therefore the conditions of living will be improved. And that's a political reality that will vary from country to country. And we have 158 here. So you, you have to, to bear in mind that that balance will have to be common to 159 countries. So we have to move in a way that accommodates somehow the expectations and the political possibilities of each one of those countries. And it's a very tough thing to do. So that's why I think that this is going to be a very difficult task, but it's doable. I don't think that it's impossible. Mr. Azevedo, thank you very much. Thanks to all of you, and good afternoon.